you guys, it is Reed. Welcome back to another video. Today I got a very special guest. We got Sarah. She is gonna be helping me out with a few performances. I'll be doing one in this video and a couple more. Today we're gonna be doing a trick, an original of mine called Mental Image. And I hope you guys like it. Let's just get right into it. So we're gonna be using a regular deck of bikes and I need you to give those a quick shuffle. She got a pretty nice shuffle. Look at that. Whew, crisp. Good? Yep. All right, so first I just need you to touch any card you want, okay? This one right here? Yep. Okay. Take a look at that card, I won't look. Mm -hmm. You got it? Yep. All right, we'll take that and we'll push it right into the middle of the deck like that. You can see it's squared up on all sides, okay? You can give that uh, deck a shuffle if you'd like. Oof. That was rough. It's fine. <laughs> So when you're done, you can just push, put the deck off to the side. I keep it, I keep it on frame. Yeah, perfect. So here's what we're gonna do. A lot of magicians do a pick a card trick, right? They have, they have you take a card, and you know they can use sleight of hand, or maybe you think I influenced you to pick that card or something. So it wouldn't be as impressive if I just picked that card because you actually touched the one yes. you wanted. So we're gonna create a mental image of a new card in your in your head. Okay, okay. so step one, I'm gonna give you two roles, okay? You can mm -hmm. either be the hero or the villain. Now the hero always tells the truth, the villain always lies. The only rule is whatever role you pick, you have to stay in character for the rest of this trick, okay? okay. So pick one character in your head now, don't tell me. Oh God. Okay. You got one? Mm -hmm. All right. Now here's what we'll do next. The only thing that will keep consistent about the card you picked is the color. Everything else we will change, okay? Mm -hmm. So my first question for you, remember, answer in character. Did you pick a face card? No. No. Interesting. Okay. Now, here's a moment where I'll let you start to make some decisions. Um, you, your card was a certain color. I don't know what color it is. Like I said, that's the only thing we'll keep consistent. Mm -hmm. So e if it was a black, you either have clubs and spades. If it was a red, you either have hearts and diamonds. Yes. So right now, it, that card was a suit, the one you picked, okay? Yes. I'm gonna let you change your mind to the other suit in that color if you'd like. Okay. Right now you can make that decision. Okay, you've made it? Yep. So you have a new suit now. So keep your, that suit in mind, this is your new suit. My only other question I'm gonna ask you, I'm only answer, asking you two questions. They're very big, broad questions and aren't gonna give me much info, but did you change your mind? No. No. Here's the interesting thing. Now you have a brand new suit, okay? Mm -hmm. Now from that suit, obviously the value is the hardest thing for me to predict in a card. So here's what we'll try. Uh, let's say if you picked a number card, switch to any picture card you want. And if you switch to a picture, if you pick a picture card, switch to any number card you want, okay? Mm -hmm. Any one at all. Okay. So now you've created a new card in your head. You have that card, right? Imagine that card, I want you to focus on the card. This okay. is your new card that only exists in your mind. Think about it, I don't know the color, I don't know the suit, I don't know the value. These are all things you created in your head. But I'm gonna try to make a little bit of a prediction. Let's see. Um, oh, I forgot to take the joker out. I hate when I do that because if someone picks a joker in this, <laughs> it never usually works out too well. Um, hmm, keep thinking about your card for me. Okay. Okay. Here's what we'll do. I'm not going to touch the deck again. I have locked in a prediction. Okay. For the first time, tell everyone the card you were just thinking of. The king of clubs. The king of clubs. Now Sarah, I put one card very specifically on the top of this deck. Oh. Take a look and show the camera. <laughs> the king of clubs. That is mental image, hope you guys enjoy. What is good guys, it is Reed and welcome back to How to Make Your Magic Better, episode three. Today, this episode is gonna be focused on sleight of hand. You didn't think this would all be about uh, just the language, I hope. Of course, sleight of hand is important to make our magic better. I'm not just gonna be talking about moves. That's not, not the idea of this. I'm just gonna be talking about how to, you know, select the right slights to elevate your magic, uh, how to, you know, cover slights, how to properly use them, and when to use what, and, and what you should be looking for to have the best overall trick. It's really what slights can help the method achieve the best overall effect. That's really the goal that I'm going for. You know, slides can definitely take our magic to the next level. It's not only about presentation. Now, presentation is very important and it can have this effect, it can really strengthen the tricks that we're doing, but so can sleight of hand. 
it really boils down to that method. And, and sometimes different slights can be better for different situations. And it's really important when, if you're creating your own tricks to decide which ones to use in which situations, things can feel more fair, things can be more invisible. And a slight in some cases can really make the effect. Oftentimes presentation makes the effect, but there are cases where sleight of hand is important. And that's why I think it's really important that we talk about that in this episode of how to make your magic better. Now you'll often hear magicians say it's all about the effect, it's all about the presentation. And while that is true to an extent, those things are often very important and, and they're often left out. Slights and method are still extremely important. Oftentimes it's method that can lead us to the incredible effect and without the right method, you know, the effect is, is nothing. So I do want to stress that it's a bit of a marriage between method and effect that ultimately is important uh, at the end of the day. And, and that's why I wanted to dive in something that was a little bit more method focused in this episode, like sleight of hand and the slights that you pick. So obviously slights are very important. They're really the fundamental piece of many tricks, uh, all kinds of magic. And it's really important that you decide what you want the effect to become, what you want the end result to be, what you want your audience to experience. And a lot of times people will start with the method and that's fine, but the method should come in my opinion, after you know the effect, right? Sometimes you have a cool move and then you can tailor an effect around it and it's good. But the greatest effects are, in my opinion, when you come up with what you want the final piece to look like and work backwards, it allows you to pick the best slights for that situation and, and really assess all your options when you're creating. One thing I like to do when I'm when I'm working, when I'm creating uh, a new effects and, and I need a move, you know, I need a move that controls a, a selection to the middle. I like to, to make a pros and cons list in my head of, of the slights and you can write this out too if you want. So, you know, let's take three controls. We'll have the, the DPS, we'll have the, the classic pass and a simple cut control, like a double undercut. We have to assess what's the pros and the cons. So the pros of the DPS, you know, they can take the card, they can handle it, they can sign it. Same with all three of these controls, really. They can take the card, they can handle that card and give it back to you. So that's, that's an even playing field. With a DPS, you know, you kind of have to put the card back in the middle rather than them. So that could be a bit of a con. Um, the action's very clean and it just seems like you're pushing the card into the middle and the card is controlled. So I love that and that is a major pro in my opinion. The pass has the nice pro where they get to put their card back, but a lot of people, you know, the, the pass is, is too difficult and, and the pass is never really invisible. So you have to kind of weigh that in. You know, you don't want people to think there's a funny move. So you kind of want to do it in an offbeat. So that's a bit of a con. And then the cut control, you know, they get to put it back, all that good stuff. But then you have the, the cutting and after the card's been put back, which isn't quite as clean um, because that's when they could think that you have controlled their card. So, you know, that's how I would approach it. Go through all the slights that could work for the situation and eliminate the ones quickly that don't do something really specific that you need for this effect. So, you know, any slights that would require you to start with a double, right? There are a lot of slights where you start with a double. Well, then you can't hand that card out for them to touch. You can't, you could have them sign it, but you got to hold it on the deck, right? So if that's a situation and you want to be able to give the card out to them, it's crucial for this trick. And obviously, you know, don't use all of those slights. So all this to say that you can really kind of narrow in on which slights are the best and then narrow down to the final selection on which is best for which trick. Most of my tricks have a slight that I use with them. I don't always use one, you know, my, my preferred slight is, is like the squeeze shift here. And I use that a lot, but I do use other slights for different tricks and, and they're programmed in when I write out the effect. So after I've created, I'll write out how it's done just so I remember. And, and I'll always have a specific control in there. And, and usually it's a well-calculated control and I use that specific control for a reason. When I'm teaching, you know, a, a lot of times I'll say, use whatever one you want, even though I have a preference. And a lot of times I, I tell you guys what the preference is. Sometimes different things work for different people. So you really got to evaluate, you know, what you can do the best and what looks the best for you and what you want that trick to be. Another thing I, I've been talking about writing down slights. I have a list, a massive list of, of every single slight that I can do. And so whenever I'm like, okay, I need a control to the top. I need a control to the bottom. I need a 
false shuffle. I can scroll through the list to the section. It's sectioned off, I'll go to the false shuffle section and I'll go through the false shuffles and I have them all on paper. It really helps you remember everything that you could use, all the different methods. Even the slides that I don't like are on that list because I could do them and maybe one day it's gonna be the perfect slide for a situation. So that's a little, little tip, a little something I like to do to really keep track of these slides and it'll really help when you're creating. You know, another thing that I wanna stress is that the harder slide is not always the better slide. Some self-working slights, kind of like the cross-cut force, for example. One of the most frying, most amazing forces of all time. I have a video on that you guys should check out because uh, it's my favorite force of all time. It's not always right, and I don't use it every time I want to force a card because it's not always right. But when it is, it's so strong and it, it's so easy. Whereas, you know, my spread force handling is a little more technical and it feels really nice, really fair. That's probably the one I use the next most. But still, you know, the crosscut force is stronger in a lot of situations than that force. So just keep that in mind. Harder is not always better. It's how it applies to the situation. As a quick example, I, I've talked about this trick before, the connection where I basically give two spectators a deck and they shuffle them and, and they end up picking the, the same card out of their deck and I don't really touch the deck at all. There is a crosscut force in that and if I used any other kind of force where I had to touch the deck and force it, it would just totally throw off the chemistry of the trick and that's why the crosscut force is so great for that. And maybe if I didn't have that written down, I wouldn't have even thought to use the crosscut force when I was creating that trick. So having this list and, and understanding that harder is not always better is really important. Sometimes harder is better, you know, it can be. Like a, like a beautifully executed classic pass can look great. A beautifully executed, you know, squeeze shift, DPS sort of shift can look fantastic, but they are a lot more difficult to get perfect. Now, here's an interesting sort of side topic. You know, I considered almost making a video on this totally, and, and maybe I might, but there's always the question, slights or gimmicks, right? It's a big, big debate. Uh, the pure sleight of hand guys, kind of like myself, tend to think gimmick work, it, it, you suck if you use gimmick work. And the, the guys who use the gimmicks say, you know, we don't need all these slights to be able to perform amazing magic. And I think the answer to that question lies somewhere in the middle. Now, these two uh, items, these two skills, these two uh, forms of magic are best when they're, they're together, okay? And, and I will always be a sleight of hand guy, that's my thing, but it doesn't mean I don't see the value in gimmicks. I don't use very many. There's a few here and there that I use because the things you can do with gimmicks are impossible with sleight of hand. Some things, of course. You know, I, I use things like, uh, I'll use a few maybe gimmicked cards, but they, they'll be really fair feeling cards. Stuff I can hand out and let people feel. And that's just for me, for my style. I like to be pretty organic, but gimmicks and slights are both very important. Slights, you know, it's nice to be able to pick up someone's deck that they give you and, and blow their mind. That's always something that you're gonna have when you know great sleight of hand. Whereas with gimmicks, you're always bringing the gimmick and it can't always be examined. And that's where I think gimmicks fall short. But if you can present it right, you don't always need to have your gimmick examinable. It is nice. In some situations, I think you really do need to have it be examined. And some people disagree, you know, they, they, they'll have their gimmick deck and they think, oh, I don't really need to show people they're different. When you get out there and perform, you'll get skeptics and you'll see that that is important. People won't believe if they can't inspect. The first time, you know, someone asks to check out your gimmick deck and you have to say no, you're gonna run into some problems. That's why I try to use them sparingly, but the tricks that I do use with a few little gimmicks, use them together and they're absolutely amazing. Some of the best magic is when you combine gimmicks with great sleight of hand. And stuff you can do is absolutely uh, really incredible. Um, one thing I'll recommend, you know, my probably favorite gimmick trick of all time would be a trick called Face Off, which you can pur purchase on Illusionist. You know, it's worth it. it it's, it's something you can build yourself. You can build as many as you want of them. And the, the final effect is absolutely unbelievable. Something you'd never be able to achieve with sleight of hand, with pure sleight of hand. But this does require some slights in there to make it extra convincing. So I love that. Uh, go check that out if you guys don't know what that trick is. It, it's not too difficult to perform. Uh, it's a little tricky to build the gimmick the first time, but once you get it, it's an amazing, amazing effect. You know, basic slights are essential, and I think in some form they're always going to be very important and fundamental. And I think everyone who's into card magic or any kind of magic should learn the basics and the fundamentals, even if you only want to be a kind of gimmick uh, oriented guy. You know, like I was saying, with people wanting to examine, that's the difference of using a regular deck versus versus a one-way force deck. It's hard to be able to show that. 
And trust me, people are gonna believe the magic a whole lot more when you can put the object in their hands. They can feel it and see that it is what you say it is. Anytime you can do that, it's gonna make it so much stronger. People do this thing when, they're, when, when they see a great magic trick where they try to figure out how it's done. A lot of people do this and they'll jump to oftentimes irrational conclusions that don't make any sense. And a lot of times they'll say things like, oh, the deck was all the same card or you had multiple of those cards and when you're using a gimmick you know a lot of times you do and so when you when you can you know shut that down um at the beginning like if you're using a, a one-way force deck and you can't show this this totally shuts down a major possibility and something people will immediately jump to you know when they can't explain something they often jump to oh it's not real which means the prop must not be real. The next question I wanted to dive into that I hear a lot is, is advanced, like quite advanced sleight of hand worth it? And my uh, answer to that is absolutely. The things you can do with some of the more advanced sleights are just things that you absolutely cannot even remotely do with, with certain basic sleights. If you take the time to really learn some of these handling, some of these advanced slights that you can do some real miracles with. You'll be able to do the most incredible thing with anyone's deck of cards. You can pick it up and you can do some really incredible magic. Advanced sleight of hand, you know, it, it's kind of a journey and, and spending time trying to master something as technical and difficult as that is really rewarding once you get it and you can start performing it and getting away with it. And it really, for me, that's one of the things that really fuels me and really entertains me is doing more difficult slights and, and pulling them off successfully. And the things you can do, I mean, just absolutely amazing. You know, once you really dive into it and, and learn all the, all the, I mean, there's so many slights out there that it's just incredible. Uh, the things you can do with just your hand and some practice. It, it really does give you that sense of accomplishment, a bit of a dedication, and, and I would recommend anyone to practice at least one slight that's quite difficult that you can't even remotely do when you start. I remember like kind of the DPS, I remember how difficult that was when I first started. And just the feeling of now doing it all the time, no problem in front of people and getting away with it is just, just an amazing feeling to know how far I've come. You know, advanced sleight of hand can increase that authenticity factor, make things feel more real because usually with advanced slights you can be more open sometimes, you can, display things in different ways you can and, and just make things feel more impossible make it feel a little bit more authentic in my eyes so i wanted to jump into some examples of how slights can really take tricks to the next level so i have this trick uh, endless combinations i think i've talked about it before in this series the basic idea is they pick a four of a kind we put them into the deck i let them shuffle and then they sh happen to shuffle those four of a kind on top now it's a really basic trick but it's really strong and the control i use is difficult, it's quite difficult, but it's what makes the trick. I mean, that whole trick is centered around a multi-card control straight into a palm. When you can execute that shift perfectly and get it by someone, you give them the deck of the shuffle and they're not looking at your palmed cards at all and they never notice, and then you replace those cards on the bottom, it's such a great feeling to know that you, you, know, you just got away with a miracle. That's all it is at the end of the day but it takes that trick to the next level. If you did anything else, if you put those four cards in and you did some kind of cut control to the top or you looked through them and did a call, it totally ruins the effect, right? The effect is you just see me push the cards in the middle and you're immediately shuffling and it needs to feel that way. It needs to feel like those cards are in the middle of the deck without a doubt and now they've mixed them up because that's all the effect is, right? It's a lucky shuffle essentially. And any other control, with any other weird moves really wouldn't do it justice. And so this is a case where, yeah, if you can't do that slight, I wouldn't do the trick at all, right? It, it's so important, that specific slight, and it just shows you how slights can be really important in that situation. You know, any card to pocket routine, usually there's several phases, right? The first phase, you'll do the card to pocket, you'll catch them off guard. That second phase has to be so clean because now they know what to look for. They'll be grilling your hands, they'll be grilling your pockets. So you have to leave them without a shadow of a doubt that this card that you're that you're taking is going into the middle of the deck and you haven't palmed it to put uh, into your pocket, right? The slights are important. If you just kind of, you know, take the card and you push it in the middle and then you start cutting and then you kind of go like this and you do something weird and you have this kind of hand then they're gonna and you go to your pocket right they're gonna they're gonna know something's going on they're gonna be watching that hand you need to be so 
you know, utterly convincing with whatever slight you use that they have no question that the card's in here. So when you're handing it out, they don't even look at this hand going to your pocket, right? This is an example of the right slight choice at the right time. You, you don't always want to use the same slights. You don't just want to keep doing the DPS always either um, because sometimes people will catch on. So you want, you want to use different slights, you know, put them in sequential order. Try to think what the person will be looking for. The first time you can do you know, a, a very easy top palm and, and, and do the card to pocket the next time. Well, maybe you need to step it up, do the DPS because they'll be watching closer. They'll be looking at this hand. So next time you do it with this hand, all these little things to think about that all come down to the control and the slight that you're using for the effect. Another uh, example is a trick called force. That's the one that I did on Spidey's uh, live stream where I was kind of pressing the card and it was appearing under my hand. And that trick, you know, took a long time to create. There was several different renditions and it's just because the slights had to be perfect, um, not even the execution, but the the sequence and the slights that I chose had to be perfect. I, I created some slights just to make this trick work. I created some subtleties in those in older slights just to make the effect work, right? The little subtlety of being able to show the hands like this and then the card appearing between the fingers rather than you know, me moving my hand back and then the card appearing. I actually left my hand in the same spot. You see there's nothing there and then it closes quickly and opens and there's a card there. If you go watch the video, you'll get a better idea of what I'm talking about. Little things like that. I had to come up with a method for that. I had to come up with a method of, of palming the card without look like closing my hand at all like i need to do i needed to do the most open palm that i could think of with all five fingers like this and it was just so crazy to get on that creative path of how i was going to do that and so things like that you know any little change in those slights is not going to bring the same effect right if you have your your hand open and they don't see a card but then you slightly move it it just it doesn't make it feel like the card appears under your hand. It makes it feel like the card was hiding behind your hand and then you moved it to show it. So just these little things, right? It's really all about the slights that I use to make this effect feel the way it does. Now, how to improve your sleight of hand? Obviously, the most important thing you can do, you know, there's nothing that's gonna help you more than this, is to subscribe to my channel, watch all my videos. <laughs> also, read. Uh, I know a lot of people don't like to read, but the best slights are in the books. I'll be honest, I don't like to read, but I love to read magic. If you're really passionate about it, you will enjoy it. And the best stuff is in there, you know? It, it always is, that's just the way things go. And other purchasable content as well, uh, video downloads that you actually have to pay for. That's where a lot of the gold is. There's some real gold on YouTube. I'm gonna be trying to teach some really great stuff, uh, especially coming up soon. I've got a lot of beginner stuff out of the way. There's still more, you know, beginner stuff and, and stuff you guys probably already know, but I really am gonna get into teaching some really cool brand new uh, slights and ideas that hopefully a lot of you guys have never seen, some that are mine, so you guys definitely have never seen, and um, I'm really excited for that. But the point is, you know, YouTube is great. Um, a lot of people don't like YouTube, but if you if you find the right places to look, if you know who to, who to follow, who's teaching right, there are a lot of great teachers on there, uh, Madison, uh, Alex Boyer, Spidey, um, Chris, all these guys teach very well and they should be the guys you're paying attention to. Um, Alex Pendre, of course, Xavier, you know, so many great guys that are out there. You just have to know where to look and YouTube can be a great platform. You know, that's where I started and ended and learned so much of what I learned was just from YouTube. But then when you want to go really to that next level, there is, there is some of that stuff on YouTube, but there's really great stuff when, you know, you're purchasing books or that downloadable content. You guys can find some amazing stuff. Uh, amazing slights really taught well, uh, usually. And uh, yeah, one thing I'll say is, you know, there's so many slights out there. You're gonna be reading and you're gonna be finding all these slights, but you don't need to be able to do all of them, right? Like imagine, you know, you, you read the classic pass in a book and you can't do it, but you write it down on your list, keep it in your mind. One day you'll be working on a trick and you'll say, you know what, the classic pass is the perfect application here. It's so good, this effect is gonna be so good that you know what, I'm gonna start learning the classic pass now. And then you go and you learn the classic pass, right? Obviously, classic pass might not be the best example for that, but some, some more unique slight. Like think of a unique slight that you don't see any application for, so you don't bother learning but you know it exists, you've read it. And that's what the point is, that's what's important. So now, if you do find a use for it, you find an amazing effect, then you can start to practice it, right? Because you're gonna be busy practicing other things, but then you'll have a reason to, and at least you know it exists. It's just great to have that knowledge 
Um, and it doesn't always have to mean that you can do it right away. Just knowing about it will really help you with your slights and your effects. Like I've been stressing, learn from good sources. That's obviously the most important thing when it comes to sleight of hand. So you're learning the right way so you don't instill bad habits. You know, uh, Royal Road, Expert at the Card Table, Expert Card Technique. Um, all of these are great, you know, books. I I've named some YouTube channels that teach really well. There are a lot of great um, stuff you can pay for, uh, you know, more downloadable video content if that's your thing. But really the key comes down to the dedication you put in, the practice you put in. Set up that mirror. Uh, mirrors are fantastic and just practice lights in the mirror, get your angles down. Go stand in front of the bathroom mirror, record yourself. All these things are super helpful. You, you know, you can see all the little nuances. You're gonna see what you look like to you. And then eventually you'll get so used with, to that angle, you won't even have to think about it anymore. Your hands will just automatically position at that angle. And that's kind of the point I find myself in now. You know, I practiced in front of a mirror for so long that I know exactly what people are seeing without having to be on that side. Video is great to be able to play back and really analyze more nuanced things as well. So I really hope you guys enjoy that video, episode three of how to make your magic better. Um, I hope you like the performance at the beginning. I want to thank Sarah for helping me out with that. That is a really fun trick I call mental image. I came up with it only about a week ago, but it's super strong and I am planning on teaching it in the pretty near future. That's one that I've recently put in my, my repertoire because it's so good, as you can tell, it's really, really good. Um, I've been really focused in on more like uh, mentalism slash not as, as slight technical uh, tricks, but stuff you can do fully surrounded with a group, stuff that's a little bit more not self-working, but feels very hands-off. There's a little bit of self-working aspects, some math principles that I've been looking into recently that are really, really good. If you make them feel not procedural, some math principles can be fantastic and uh, just stuff like that. So I hope you guys really enjoyed it. You know, comment what you think. Let me know if you're enjoying this series, what I should talk about next. And as always, please like, don't forget to subscribe and I'll catch you in the next video.